All right, continuing where we left off before, I'm going to talk briefly about specific phobia now. The 50% um, mark, more or less, for kids to develop specific phobia is age six. So this is a fairly young disorder. This happens to young kids mostly. And after six, seven, eight, not very many kids develop any specific phobia. So that's nice to know. Uh, specific phobia itself is the most common anxiety disorder in children, not adolescents, but like elementary schoolish, you know, pre-adolescent children. The, the most common targets are things like animals, nat stuff in, in the natural environment, so phobias of weather events like lightning or thunder or hurricanes or something. Blood injection injury phobia, so the whole I faint when I see a needle type thing. Situational things like seeing somebody who looks angry or being in a situation where there is somebody wearing a mask, things like that. And then other things like clowns. Yeah, clowns, it happens with some kids. It's not as common as people think, but yeah, it's there. Um, interesting note about the targets. So how common... Well, I just wonder how many people out there are going to feel pretty uncomfortable if I draw this on the screen. And anybody who has any kind of spider-related anxiety isn't going to feel very good about this. How uncomfortable do you feel? I suspect two or three people in the class feel pretty uncomfortable about this. So, I mean, that's not a spider. It's just a happy little ball of sunshine. There's no spider in Okay. How many people feel uncomfortable when I draw this? I mean, that's, that's supposed to be a gun. Um, there's an interesting fact. A lot more people are killed by guns in the United States than by spiders or snakes or dogs. And a whole lot more are killed by cars than any of the above. So I'm going to draw a terrible car. There's your wheels. Your wheel well's there. I got some wheels sticking out of there. And yet car phobias and gun phobias are incredibly rare. There are very few car phobias and gun phobias out there. That's you. <laughs> and this argues, but we have a lot of a lot more like of people who have phobias, we have a lot more dog phobias and height and falling phobias and water phobias and drowning. Um, spider phobias, snake phobias, stuff like that, blood phobia those things are much more common so this argues for the genetic basis for phobias because we just haven't had evolutionarily enough time with cars and guns for people to develop phobias of them if we have cars and guns for about 50,000 years consecutively then I suspect we'll have a lot of phobias of those things um, but by then we'll just have like implants in our brains and we won't even be they'll just be consciousnesses in a network of computers on some gas giant planet I don't know Maybe we'll still be here. Maybe we'll never do anything else. So, um, a phobia is specifically a fear in response to a target. If you don't have a target, it's not a phobia. And phobias promote avoidance. We're going to talk more about that. Avoidance is a major component of anxiety disorders and is one of the things that causes a lot of the problems. We avoid things, and because we avoid certain things, we have problems getting the things that we need in our lives. Um, and then the it's not a phobia unless it causes impairment. So, of course, you've got to have that impairment business. It's got to impair your Leben and your Arbeiten. So it impairs your schoolwork and or your relationships with other people. And they do. I mean, if you can't go places with your family, if the family has to kind of shut down every time you have a phobic meltdown for something, if the family can't go near water anymore because you're afraid of water, or if, you know, if, if you can't go to school because, you know, you're afraid of being away from your sources of safety at home and things like this, or you can't go to school because you're afraid of the parrot that's in the school classroom. These kinds of things, uh, these kinds of things are the Leben and the Arbeiten problems. And so that's what always happens in the DSM to define a disorder. That's the approach it takes. So there's generally two kinds of physiological responses that have to, that phobias have. Most phobias, you know, your heart it's a terrible heart. I don't really know exactly what hearts look like. Your heart goes crazy. And your lungs 
kind of start breathing shallow and fast and your blood pressure goes up and your galvanic skin response which is electrical activity sort of a generalized um, on the surface of your skin indication of overall nervous system hyperactivity so all of those things are happening this is still you <laughs> even if you can't see it <laughs> all of those things are happening so it's still recording you even if you can't see it on the screen just letting you know so all of those things happen with most phobias in other words it's the fight or flight response so here we go F or F fight or flight response however BII phobia which is blood injection injury phobia has a totally different pattern so you can't treat it the same way the treatment involves reconditioning your autonomic responses your your nervous system responses to the this to the threat and so if you if you don't have all this increased stuff what do you do well the treatment for BII phobia is quite different I'm not an expert in it but it's very different because in BII phobia you have your blood pressure drops your heart rate drops your respiration becomes deep or even stops briefly um, your galvanic skin response goes down to a lower charge level all these things you, your body shuts down and so if you see the person who sees blood and their eyes roll back and they faint everybody laughs ah, ha, 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 ha. you're laughing at a phobia you're laughing at a person who has a mental disorder they can't help it it's it's built in and treatment for that is actually really interesting and it's um, yeah that's an extreme version of a response to that but all the lowered blood pressure and heart rate it can be a shock and make you pass out so social phobia let's talk about that otherwise known as social anxiety disorder so you can see here that the peak is a social anxiety peak around age 13 ish um, so social phobia the primary feature is persistent fear of social consequences of negative social consequences so humiliation embarrassment all of these things these are social these are negative social consequences other phobias like the phobias we look at fear of dogs underlying that even if it becomes irrational and they always become irrational otherwise it's not a disorder um, they always become irrational but it's but underlying it is a fear of something that could hurt you physically right uh, but social phobia is something that could hurt you socially you're afraid of social harms everybody's afraid of social harm I mean we are social creatures most of our our good and bad stuff that happens to us is social most of our dangers and rewards in life are social and so it makes sense that we have this whole class of disorders but social phobia is an exaggerated pattern of fear uh, of social harms so you're afraid of embarrassing or humiliating yourself and so people who have social phobia probably the worst thing you could possibly do to them is embarrass them or humiliate them in public and you should probably go to prison for that that's a pretty horrible thing to do if you did it on purpose sometimes it's a fear of acting in an embarrassing way which would lead to the embarrassment or humiliation because we know that would happen it's almost always in a social or performance situation so people with social phobia frequently it takes the form of extreme fear of public speaking or reading aloud or writing in ways that other people can see your writing so social phobia can express itself in like writer's block but a specific kind where I can't write anything because I'm afraid of what people will see when they see my writing not so much I have no ideas but more like fear of evaluation by other people so the fear of evaluation and negative judgment by other people is the fundamental uh, component of social phobia it has a whole bunch of secondary symptoms though um, people can sometimes be accused of not having any problems if they have social phobia because in some situations they're fine most of those situations will be where they're familiar with people because you're afraid of a negative evaluation if you're comfortable that you're not going to get certain negative evaluations with certain people you become comfortable with it even an irrational fear like social phobia I mean it it eventually it does respond in some way to conditioning and so if you've lived years with people like your parents or your family or your best friend or something and you know the kinds of evaluations you'll get from them and that becomes a little more grounded in reality then you're not afraid of them it's gonna be unfamiliar situations unfamiliar people that is, that are gonna be the biggest problems now of course because this is an autonomic nervous system type thing this is a classic phobia it's not BII you have people with social phobia will sometimes go to their doctors with somatic complaints somatic means physical body complaints blushing restlessness sweating 
uh, complaining of illness, stomach aches, especially young children do this because children are very bad at explaining what they're feeling, especially why they're feeling it. I mean, it's complicated to know what you're feeling and put it together with a potential cause. So uh, often with many anxiety disorders and the younger the children, the more likely this is to happen. You won't get a complaint from the child themselves of anxiety. You'll get a complaint of um, something physical, stomach aches, headaches, sweating, I'm sick all the time, that sort of thing. So people tend to avoid, and I mentioned avoidance is going to be a big thing with a lot of anxiety disorders, so avoidance is going to be a big thing. People will start avoiding the situations that have the phobic thing. So they avoid social situations where they could be negatively evaluated by other people. And so this has a lot of consequences, like there's very low self-esteem in social phobia because people know that they're supposed to, that there's pressure for them to do certain social things. Like they're supposed to be able to stand up in front of the class and read something. They're supposed to be able to say hi when mom introduces them to somebody and they just can't ever, you know. And so they feel bad about themselves. Selective mutism becomes uh, a big problem in a lot of younger children where children will speak only to a, a certain few people in their lives and will absolutely will not speak to other people and sadness loneliness and it harms your educational achievement if you can't participate in school and you start missing school because missing school becomes a big deal with a lot of these things too especially the social phobia issue so moving on so the prevalence is about one to two percent now my benchmark is always ADHD you know five ish percent one to two percent is lower. The onset is usually the mid to late teens, but look back here, I mean on our chart it says 13, so different estimates, but the peak, well the 50% the midpoint is 13, but I think it picks up a little while after that, so these are both accurate statements. You need to be able, however, to see yourself from the outside. Now this is a weird old way of saying it, see yourself as an object. You need to be able to imagine that you are like what you look like from the outside. You can't understand social evaluation until you understand what you look like to other people. And that doesn't happen. Oops, I just dropped a really important thing. That doesn't happen until kids are four or five years old usually. You need um, some fairly complex parts of your brains to develop with the right kind of environmental experiences to help that happen. You need to be able to take perspectives. Now this is an advanced version of theory of mind. You need to be able to understand. So this is, um, this is involved in theory of mind. That T-O-M means theory of mind. That's how it's usually abbreviated. Although it's not Tom, I, sh I should remember that's a capital M. So theory of mind, being able to think about what other people are thinking. Thinking about other people's thoughts, thinking about other people's think. You can't be afraid of social evaluation unless you can think about what other people think of you, right? And you be able to you need to be able to think of yourself as a separate person from other people. Um, and so you have to have some tasks with a social evaluative component in your life. So there are people who don't have social phobias because they just have an incredibly restricted experience. They're not around anybody unfamiliar almost ever. And some of those people might have a terrible experience when they finally are around unfamiliar people. They'll suddenly realize that not everybody is your family and your five friends. So um, that's why this is not happening until about childhood or early adolescence. You can't do these things. Plus, once you're able to do these things, you start to do them constantly. This thinking about social evaluation and stuff because you're concerned about it all the time. It's a major it's a major task of your life. We are kind of programmed with a combination of genetics and our culture to prepare ourselves for the social aspect of survival. And so that's when it really kicks in, is in early adolescence. So let's briefly talk about what it means when they say a disorder has a certain course. This is a special medical word that's been applied to um, mental disorders as well. The course is the pattern of symptoms after the disorder starts. So there are some common words like chronic course, acute course, subacute, recurrent. So you should be kind of be familiar with these things as we go along. This will make a this will pop up over and over again in this field for you. The more medically connected the stuff is, the more likely this will pop up for you. Um, chronic course means it's long lasting, it's persistent, and it's often affecting multiple systems. So chronic is bad. Chronic course means there's not much likelihood that this is going to get better on its own. It's also usually meaning that there's a low likelihood, a lower-ish likelihood of it getting better even with help, even with treatment. Acute course means it starts suddenly and it gets back quickly, but it can also uh, back off 
relatively quickly. Subacute is in between those two. Recurrent means on again, off again, and I couldn't help myself. I had to put a picture of you know the stupidest television couple that's ever been on television. They were really a terrible couple. Nobody should have ever thrown them together. I really hate Ross and Jennifer Aniston. Rachel should have gotten together with Joey. That's that's what should have happened. Should have been Rachel and Joey. Come on, people. Ross, whatever, man. He's messed up. He'd, he'd find somebody someday. Some other nerdy professor. Who am I to argue with that? All right, so social phobia has chronic course in general. It does not tend to be a quick thing that comes and goes. If you've got social phobia, it's most likely, statistically speaking, that you're going to be dealing with it the rest of your life with it or something else that kind of develops from it. The duration, it often remits by adulthood, but the problems in a, in a subclinical sense tend to last for years and years. But it does tend to kind of go away by adulthood for a lot of people, at least the most acute clinical version, clinical symptoms. And it has very high comorbidity, mostly with other anxiety disorders. Now this right here, if you have high comorbidity, mostly with other anxiety disorders, what that should be suggesting to you is that you have just a general anxiety proneness and it can express itself as various things. So you have social anxiety disorder and then later, early in the life you had a phobia and then later in life maybe you're diagnosed with GAD or something which is maybe exactly, maybe is this. Um, so when you have something that is comorbid with other things that are like it, that should be suggesting to you the possibility, not the certainty, but the possibility that this thing is deeply tied into the fundamental underlying like diathesis, underlying predisposition for the problem. So social anxiety having a high co comorbidity with other anxiety disorders suggests that in about two seconds I'm going to say get out of here and go in the house because <laughs> this is getting ridiculous. I'm serious. One more thing and then you can go in the house. The house is nice and warm and cozy. You can stay in there. So um, it's mostly comorbid with other anxiety disorders. That should suggest to you that it is tied into the underlying condition. So whatever anxiety proneness actually is. So the treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy with modifications, which is the treatment for every anxiety disorders. And the B is a big, big thing. So anxiety disorders, you need the behavioral stuff to be you need the behavioral stuff to be extremely strong here hang on parenting moment hopefully we're started back up again after that little thingy that I'm gonna edit out all right so since most anxiety disorders what you're gonna treat is the response the anxiety response by provoking it it's called um, well, systematic desensitization is one word for the exact way you do it. You, you expose a person. It's all a version of exposure therapy. You expose a person to uh, the anxiety, the anxiety-provoking stimulus. They feel the anxiety, and you do it under controlled conditions so that over repeated exposures, then you kind of retrain a person's nervous system not to have that response. The B is huge. So sitting around and thinking about it, has very little effect. Talking about how irrational your phobias are, or your social anxiety, basically has no effect whatsoever on your anxieties. What does have an effect on them is the experience of going through the exposure. Now don't go doing exposure with people because if you do it wrong you make it worse. You make their disorder worse. So you have to do it the right way. So a lot of the components that are in here, I mean you expose a person to their anxiety uh, situation. So you might have people eventually, not at first, um, little by little, working up to where they stand up in front of a crowd and speak or go to a party and talk to people or something. But you practice a lot of relaxation, like deep breathing, like imaging, stuff like that. You have some participant modeling that often comes in. This isn't, these are, these are always there, exposure, the relaxation. And you have um, participant modeling, so sometimes you have the therapist or other people. This works pretty well in group therapy because then you can have other members of the group modeling how to effectively deal with anxiety, etc. And contingency management, so that's 
trying to, the contingencies are the behavioral consequences, so the reinforcements, the punishments. So you're trying to change the um, consequences of a person's behavior, especially their avoidance behavior, because avoidance is one of the things you're treating. You're trying to reduce the avoidance of the feared stimulus situation. So you try to manage how much a person is reinforced or punished by those situations to try and change the way that uh, disorder affects them. So an overall theme of all disorders is that reinforcement of avoidance is underlying them heavily. Now, there's still the genetic component, it's still biological, it's an uphill battle sometimes, especially with something like GAD, but reinforcement of avoidance is one of the things that is happening. And some people are more prone to develop that chain reaction, and some people are less prone to it. Some people want to hang on to it, their biology, their nervous system uh, was just kind of built. To, to hang on to that reinforcement avoidance thing, and some people less, and probably a little more if they have the disorder. But you treat this with behavioral therapy. You expose people to the, overall there's just a basic pattern. You expose people to the thing that makes them anxious, and you prevent them from avoiding it. You prevent them from escape. That sounds terrible, but of course you do this with their consent in ways that they are involved in, and you do it gradually, a little at a time, most of the time. You can do it all at once, but why would anybody do that? That's intense. So let's talk about separation anxiety disorder. This happens at a young age also. This is um, a toddler disorder mostly. And uh, its primary symptom is anxiety about your major attachment figures. It's anxiety about being separated from, from them or harm happening to them. These are the things that you're worried about when you have separation anxiety disorder. Now, every kid is worried about this. Pretty much every kid worries about these things, but when it becomes excessive, when it affects your relationships, when it kind of like modifies the way the family has to do everything, when you can't go to preschool or whatever, yeah, that's a problem. So it has a bunch of secondary symptoms, like being seen as clingy, generally fearing... Okay, let's just stop here. Saying that this is a secondary symptom, I mean, your book, I think, lists this, a separating secondary symptom of anxiety disorder? No, I don't think so. There's just this anxiety proneness, and that's what this is. So if you have um, separation anxiety disorder because you have anxiety proneness and it expressed itself that particular way, well then yes, you also have general fearfulness and anxiety. I mean, yeah, this isn't like happening because you have anxiety disorder. I don't think that makes much logical sense. I could be wrong if the research shows this, but I think logically it makes most sense. This is just an expression of the underlying um, problem that gave rise to the disorder in the first place. Nightmares, somatic complaints, again, always, especially with kids who can't express their feelings very well. They express behaviors and they express sickness and physical complaints. But you also get depression and apathy. You also get... Um, a reluctance to go places, which makes sense because you don't want to be separated. Reduced peer activities because you don't want to be separated from your parents, but then you get reduced peer contact and all the benefits of like peer socialization. And occasionally you get threats of self-harm, although with very young children, threats of or actual follow-up is rare. Young children tend not to harm themselves very much. Now you don't want to take it lightly, you want to take these things seriously, but you should feel a little more confident that you're not. You shouldn't be as scared as if it were a teenager, for instance. And kids tend to sleep with their parents for a very long time uh, as part of this. Now, this is weird. This is, you're saying this is a symptom? This is such a judgmental thing. There's a whole cross-cultural psychology and anthropology thing that's been going on with this for like 50, 70, 80 years now. There are cultures in which kids sleep with their parents until they're teenagers. That is pretty normal. Um, so calling that a symptom, if there's an expectation that the kids don't sleep with the parents past a certain age, then uh, separation anxiety disorder tends to lead them to do it a lot, a lot longer than they would otherwise have done it. But there's a wide variation in how much that actually happens in practice on a normal level, and so you can't just say that's a symptom. So the prevalence is kind of big, from 3 to 12%. These are really big numbers. The onset... Um, now, this study, the research, 
uh, that the textbook put in here suggests that onset is from age 9 to 13 and yeah it does have that onset but you have about half of the about half of the cases are done by preschool so from age 1 to 4 um, periodic distress is pretty normal and then especially if they're if after a stress or trauma so you have to be careful not to over diagnose this when kids have had something big happen like if a, if a toddler learns that their grandparent dies yeah they might have separation anxiety symptoms for months after that but it's probably not a disorder statistically speaking but keep your eye on it you know the course tends to be variable and it often gets worse it's usually gone by adolescence, and I'm going to put a big fat asterisk here, without treatment. If it's gone by adolescence, then it's probably turned into something else. In many cases, if you have an anxiety disorder um, when you're a toddler, remember that the earlier a problem sets in, the more likely it is to be a fairly serious problem that comes from a really basic difference in the way your nervous system works compared to other people's and so if you have separation anxiety disorder and you're in elementary school or preschool or something that's probably because you have basic anxiety proneness like whatever that underlying anxiety thing is and so if you have separation anxiety disorder at a young age then and most people do because it's mostly a young age thing despite what I mean onset does happen at 9 30 for 13 for a lot of people but like half or less anyway but if you have something that sets in when you're young, then it's probably a big problem. And so if it changes, if, if the separation anxiety disorder diagnosis is gone, it's probably replaced with a different diagnosis later on. The comorbidity is especially common with GAD. Once again, more evidence that what's going on here is you just have anxiety proneness and then separation anxiety disorder is one expression of the anxiety proneness. But there is a theory that this is just GAD, that GAD is just an assessment of basic anxiety proneness. So, so if you have something that has a strong link, a strong correlation in populations between the disorder and then GAD, then that thing is probably pretty deeply biologically rooted as much as anxiety disorders are. And they have a fairly strong biological component. The treatment is the same as for social anxiety disorder. It's adapted to the client. I've done a little bit of this. It wasn't what I did most of in grad school, but I did some of this for a professor. Um, exposure, which means separate the kid from their parents. And I'll talk about how to do that effectively. You do it in a way that, that is helpful. And it's hard to get kids cognitively on board when they're little. It's hard to help them understand, but that's part of the art of being a psychotherapist, I think the science is you need to do the separation for a certain number of minutes and you watch the heart rate and then you need to manage the contingencies and then plot the percentage of time that if they do this, then they avoid this, right? That's the sciencey side of it. But some of the art is like, how do you convince a six year old who is terrified of being five seconds without their mom that they need to go a few minutes without their mom? How do you convince them to do this, right? So there's, there's actually kind of some fun art involved in that. School refusal is one of the main outcomes of um, separation anxiety disorder. If it continues, which for a lot of kids it does, into elementary school, past preschool. So school refusal is, is a natural outgrowth. If you can't stand to be separated from your parents, then you don't want to go to school. And no kid, well, very few kids, that, that kid I said named Ani, he'll probably love preschool. But um, most kids do not want to be separated from their parents when they start going to preschool. That's one reason why preschool usually starts just a couple hours a day in daycare, you know, get you gradually eased into the idea that you're not going to be with your parents 24-7. But if you have separation anxiety disorder, oh, it's just a whole other level of terrible trying to convince a kid to let their parents go. I mean, they can scream for hours after their parents leave the daycare or the preschool or whatever. Most kids cry for a little while and then they're like, okay, well, here I am. Oh, there's a sandbox. Cool. I'm going to play in the sand. Kid with separation anxiety disorder, not so much. Just keep screaming for like a few hours, maybe. Or go curl up in the corner and cry for like all day. So it can be pretty bad. The prevalence of school refusal is about 1% to 2%, and it overlaps pretty heavily with, social ang with separation anxiety disorder. There don't tend to be any gender differences in this particular thing. The, the exposure therapy is you need to get the kid back to school. And then if you can get the kid back to school, school kind of... A gives us therapy every day all day it kind of exposes us to things that are somewhat unpleasant somewhat 
anxiety provoking but also some fun things and some happy things and so it kind of gives us therapy every day and gets us used to being away from our parents and gets us used to all the other stuff you have to do, like sit down and just do work for a few hours how boring is that all right GAD GAD probably just is anxiety I mean the evidence seems to suggest that the fact that you get this diagnosis and the median age of diag well not the median age yeah is that median age does the math work out anyway let's say median median diagnosis age there is about 17 18 years old suggests it, this is probably with GAD because a lot of these other things here are manifestations of underlying anxiety and GAD is the underlying anxiety so there's an argument to be made that if you have a diagnosis of GAD what you're really being diagnosed with is just having a really high level of anxiety proneness and so most of the time you cycle through various other um, diagnoses at this point or you will cycle through them at other points in your life and uh, my first client I ever saw at grad school we just had to interview people who would come in we'd say you don't have to have a disorder just come in and be interviewed you know undergrad students come in and be interviewed by these new therapist people and we were first year students we were terrified of this we had to video it and get you know criticized by the professor it was quite a kind of terrifying that's when I discovered that I had social <laughs> well I don't think I had social anxiety disorder but I was much more scared of that than I thought I would be but it turned out not to be too bad at all the professor was great so um, this woman came in, she was in her 40s, and she explained that she had had what she thought was OCD several times in her life, that she had had OCD uh, for exercising, that she had exercised obsessively, and to the point everybody was telling her how great she looked and how thin she was, but it was not healthy. She said I, she didn't feel happy, she felt miserable, she didn't exercise because she wanted to be healthy, it's because she the anxiety built up so badly if she didn't exercise a certain number of hours always more and more and more hours every day that she had to do it to deal with the anxiety well she kind of just white knuckled it and kind of worked out exposure therapy for herself and forced herself to go cold turkey from exercise she was still quite thin and trim when I met her so I guess she still got a lot of exercise but um, she just forced herself to stop and then she was okay for a while. She said she'd always been kind of an anxious, nervous person. And then there was something else. I can't remember what it was. It might have had to do with eating or... Anyway, people thought it was something else. With the exercise, people thought she was just super fit and awesome. And then there was something else. Um, oh, it was actual pure OCD rituals, like flipping light switches certain numbers of times and turning on and off the stove certain numbers of times and flipping your key in the car ignition certain number of times and it was driving her family nuts so she once again like kind of brute force which is kind of amazing who does this forced herself to like exposure expose herself to you know the, the anxiety stuff without doing her rituals and then after a few months she was pretty much free of this so she came in to talk to me and we referred her to a clinic because she because it had now gone internal that now it was just worry she just couldn't stop worrying there was no behavioral thing so she, there was nothing for her to white knuckle anymore she couldn't force herself to stop worrying you can force yourself behaviorally not to turn the switch you can force yourself not to go to the gym and run or lift weights or whatever but you can't as easily force yourself to just stop worrying and her worry was destroying her family's relationships with her she couldn't let them go places she was constantly calling her her husband her kids multiple times a day to make sure they were okay um, her husband was like I gotta do my job honey you can't call every five minutes which is literally how bad it was so she came in because she couldn't deal with it anymore and my professor just said that's GAD I mean probably OCD with that but GAD like this is she has she is anxiety prone and it's taken all these different forms now this is a GAD an OCD type example but GAD is anxiety and worry it's just basic deep anxiety proneness it's extremely difficult to control it's not situation limited it's not necessarily due to a recent stress it's just always there and it's the prognosis is not great so um, in some cases it's fairly common to have excessive concern about your competence about being able to do certain things it's competent it's common to have perfectionism now none of these by themselves are GAD right these are things that people normally have everybody's worried they're not good enough sometimes uh, some people are perfectionistic not me but some people and these people have unreasonably high standards for themselves in various areas and then this is the big thing this this slide doesn't tell you how strong these are relatively but this is big worry about almost everything 
people who have GAD, the people around them will describe them as being worry warts, as being constantly worrying, as being constantly anxious. And they will constantly seek approval and reassurance from other people, like that woman who had to keep calling her family all the time and making sure, checking on them, not, let, not letting them leave home. She would go in and check on her kids multiple times every night and wake them up. And they'd be like, Mom, geez, I'm trying to sleep here. Um, so you end up with sleep disturbance. It's hard to sleep when you're worrying constantly. You end up with headaches and stomach aches because you're constantly in a state of autonomic arousal. That is bad for you. That causes headaches and stomach aches. You're constantly like, you're physiologically kind of like a person who's living through a war or kind of like a person who's living through an abusive relationship. You're that, that, your body is doing that to you, the constant state of worry. It has physical effects. It can make you ill long term. If it's extreme, it can kill you, but it has to be pretty extreme for a long time for that to happen. Hans Selye, the general adaptation response, uh, 1940s, 1950s, I think that's who's studying that kind of stuff. Um, and then you have increased risk of alcohol use because a lot of people turn to substances to try and calm down the worry. You don't worry as much, you relax a little if you're on something. So let's talk br briefly about reassurance with anxiety disorders. Don't do it. Okay, don't worry about it until it's time to start therapy. Before therapy, just be human. Reassure, be comforting, be kind, whatever. But when you start the therapy, when you're going to do behavioral therapy for anxiety, you have to not reassure people. You have to not give them any comfort. <laughs> it's so weird. I don't know why I liked this therapy so much. It was entertaining and enjoyable, but my heart went out so badly to the kids I was working with. So I was working with a little boy who had um, a contamination phobia. He had OCD, and contamination phobia is a big thing for a lot of people with OCD. So a lot of the work I did with like a half a dozen young teenage boys who had OCD, it was exactly like what you would do for a phobia because the phobia is the thing that was causing them the problems. So these, this little boy, 13, 14 years old, I say little because he was a skinny little kid, skinny little skater boy. He was a nice kid. I liked him. He was absolutely messed up about contamination. And after a few days of working on this, we worked our way up to where instead of just thinking about seeing for him it was poop poop and dirt and pee those those were the things that he was absolutely terrified of so after just a, a few days of just thinking about th seeing poop <laughs> thinking about maybe a bird pooped over there <laughs> um something like that we got to where he could get his heart rate down and do some relaxation just thinking about stuff we did our first exposure session which was to walk barefoot on his lawn on his perfectly manicured um, by a landscaping service. He had multiple maids, like two maids in their house. It was all wealthy people I worked with because my advisor only worked in this wealthy neighborhood. So his house had one or two maids that cleaned everything perfectly. The landscaping service came and trimmed their lawn like every three days, like clockwork or something. So we're working on this beautiful lawn in this nice suburb of Columbus, Ohio, and he's barefoot. And this was a big deal to get him to take off his shoes. I don't think he'd been barefoot on anything except maybe not even the shower for a couple of years at this point so he's walking on it and then he steps on a clump of what is obviously the brown grass that comes off the inside of the lawnmower you know the old grass and he stops and he says oh Darren I mean it's, I stepped on something and he looks and he says oh it's poop it's poop isn't it oh my gosh it's poop it's poop oh my gosh I stepped on poop I stepped on poop and then I'm looking at it and I'm remembering all my training for how to do this and he says it's it's not poop is it that's probably just it's probably just the stuff that came off the lawnmower right that's just probably some grass it's not poop, is it? And I looked at him really serious, and I was like, I'm not going to lie to you. It's probably poop. You know, you can't do the reassurance because the reassurance is a form of avoidance. They need to feel the anxiety so that they can retrain that nervous system. So anyway, um, moving on, that's our just little side note. GAD, the prevalence, depending on the study, it's all over the place, anywhere from 2% to 14%. This could be because GAD gets diagnosed as lots of different things. It's the most common anxiety disorder in adolescence, and it might be uh, that way because it's difficult to diagnose earlier. You don't want to diagnose like a three-year-old or a five-year-old with GAD because what if you're wrong? It's, it's a pretty stigmatizing long-term thing to stick in somebody's folder. You want to write about it. If it's there, you want it to go there, but you don't want to jump to that conclusion. And so a lot of times you let the evidence build up and people go through multiple different disorders. They have social anxiety disorder, they have a phobia, they have social anxiety disorder again, they have school refusal, they have separation. Um, 
And then at some point, a clinician will say, let's look at this and let's look at the rest. I think you have GAD, right? So GAD, the diagnosis tends not to happen until later. Median age is 10 on here. Um, I think it was a little different on our sheet. Like I say, these, there are different estimates, different studies, give you different numbers. This is a big thing about the course. The course of this thing, and you don't want to see this, it's chronic and it usually gets worse. The number and severity of the symptoms tends to get get to, to increase over time and extremely high mor morbidity so separation anxiety and phobias of course other anxiety disorders anxiety disorders that pop up in early childhood right GAD means that you have extremely high anxiety proneness you're just wired for anxiety and it's going to be the thing you struggle with um, and so yeah it makes sense that the com that the biggest comorbidities would be the things that pop up early in childhood because the earlier a disorder shows up the worse it probably is and so those kids the ones who had separation anxiety and phobias those things probably popped up earlier in life and for many of them that was an expression of the fact that they have a deep genetic loading for anxiety they're they're prepped for anxiety and uh, it's also correlated with depression and depression and anxiety have some links so anxiety disorders are going to be more highly correlated and more comorbid with other anxiety disorders in general but then beyond that the next most common comorbid comorbidity is going to be depression and depression related mood type disorders So the course is chronic, it's lifelong, the treatment is the same thing as for other um, disorders, but it's harder and there's a lot more cognitive elements to it. Like I mentioned that women trying to go cognitive thing, it's harder to do that and you're less likely to have change. You can't control as much what's going on inside someone's mind. Um, and, the, and the prognosis for it is a lot worse. Now I'm gonna tell you briefly, just kind of how a treatment uh, like this might go. So I worked with this kid who lived in a, you know, another rich kid. He didn't have a bedroom. He had a suite that was two bedrooms and had like eight or ten rooms and it was a separate building from his parents' house and it's bigger than any house I've actually lived in. That was his room. He had like a kitchen and a workout room of his own and you know, it was kind of crazy. It was weird to be there. And he had developed um, OCD and he had blood phobia. Now this isn't blood injection injury phobia. He wasn't afraid of needles. He didn't pass out. He just had a phobia of blood, very similar to the other kids' contamination and poop phobia. It was a contamination phobia. He was a teenage boy. He was about to graduate from high school when I started working with him. Um, and his parents called my advisor, and my advisor asked me if I wanted to do like contract, do the do the exposing for some money. I was super happy to do that. So I did the exposure sessions with him, and so it was dirt and contamination and blood all wrapped into one. So we worked up a list, a hierarchy of fears so that's what you do at first you explain what's going to go on you, you explain we're going to do things where you feel some anxiety and you get exposed to the thing that you're afraid of a little at a time and then we do relaxation and deep breathing and then we the next time we try it again and so i would do this with him and his his hierarchy of exposures it usually starts with imagining something so at first he's just imagining that there's some dirt on the horizon imagining that he's walking down the street and you see somebody fall down and get some and and they get cut on a piece of glass and there's a little bit of blood on the street across the street from him and at first that was quite terrifying to him we had to work on that and do some deep breathing some muscle relaxation we're doing this in between all this the exposure sessions and then kind of medium we had like 15 or 20 different steps and kind of in the middle there we had touching dirty sinks and dirty bathroom equipment and then at the very very top was having blood on him that was the worst thing he could imagine so the middle exposure sessions I don't know how I didn't get arrested because I'm this uh, you know 29 30 31 year old grad student driving around Columbus Ohio in the winter so it got dark pretty early and going to truck stops with a teenage boy and going into the bathroom for like a half an hour and then coming out what was going on is I he was 
he worked out with me that touching the sink in the bathroom of a truck stop would be super gross for him. So he'd go in and he'd just put his hands inside the sink of a truck stop bathroom and he'd hold them there for like a half an hour. And well, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, there's a reason for that time. And then we'd go out and then I'd drive him and I'd beat up little pickup truck back home to his house. Um, once he convinced me to stop at a store and I thought, oh, what's the store? He's like, oh, my dad owns this store. So, you know, they just let me go to the bathroom. So he goes to the store and then he goes and scrubs his hands. I was like, damn it, you escaped. Because I was, I wanted him to continue to feel the anxiety of having the contamination on his hands. Whether there was any or not wasn't the point. He thought there was. But he escaped by sneaking into a store his dad owned. Uh, but, you know, we did that a few times. And it was amazing how quickly the anxiety dropped. Now, he never felt good about doing that. But as we did those things, he felt good about, he felt okay about, like, getting in his parents' car. About seeing his friends you know, things he couldn't do before. It had become so bad over the previous months that he was not doing any of his fun senior year stuff. He wasn't seeing his friends. He wasn't seeing his girlfriend. He wasn't doing anything. It was all also wrapped up very much in homophobia and really inaccurate and bad ideas about AIDS and HIV. And uh, so we worked a little bit on that, but mostly it was just my end was the exposure. So his final exposure was blood. Um, and his parents were Jewish and they said, well, if you can keep kosher, that would be great. And I had to learn a little bit about this because it's not my background. So I I did, you know, like an idiot. I called around to some butchers, asked if they could get me kosher blood. And they asked, like, you know, did I actually know what kosher meant? So can't have blood. So I made some fake blood. But I didn't tell him it was fake. But I told his parents. But they promised not to tell him. I took some meat. I took some kosher lamb or something that I got from a, a kosher deli and raw and it's stuck in a blender don't ever do this because your blender you can't use it again for the rest of your life like it's very hard to clean meat stringy stuff out of the blender blades so i stuck some meat in my blender and blended it up with some water and then i strained out the water and added a little bit of red food coloring believe me that was bloody enough for him it wasn't blood it was just needy water with red food coloring in it but it smelled like blood and so as far as he knew it was blood and so we ended up with our very final exposure, which we did two or three times, with him lying on his back deck in his bathing suit with his arms out and me dripping from a paper towel from this bowl of blood, which is not really blood. Anyway, dripping it on his arms and face and chest. It looked like the most bizarre S&M ritual imaginable. Like, why am I not in prison? I don't know. But, uh, and he had to sit there with that, smelling that bloody smell and knowing that it was on him. Not knowing that it wasn't actually blood. But I would... I told him it was blood, of course. I lied. And uh, he sat there for like 20 minutes, a half an hour. And then after these sessions, which took all of maybe a month, six weeks, maybe about a month, and we were meeting like twice a week or something. After this, he was able to live his life fairly normally and relaxed and relaxed with his friends and his senior activities and his family and stuff. He was just apparently a much easier kid to live with, and he was a lot happier for the next couple of years. And... He had a relapse again, but then he didn't want to come to therapy. So anyway, so the 20 to 30 minutes thing, it's very important. The exposure session has to last that long because I'm going to put a little thingy on the screen here. Because here's what your, your physiological response. I'm going to put like hair on fire up here and then here you're just relaxed and calm. Your physiological response, right here, you're exposed to the scary thing. Boom! It spikes up like this, and it stays up there for a while, and then it kind of calms down, and then it goes up again. But this amount of time from here to here is usually about 15 to 25 minutes, if I recall correctly. So keep people in exposure for 20 to 30 minutes, closer to a half an hour just to be absolutely safe because you want to stop the exposure here you do not want to stop the exposure here but this is exactly where they want to stop the exposure because this is where they feel maximum awful so you have to come up with a plan as a therapist for how to keep them there now you prepare them you tell them this is going to happen you tell them how long it is there's no mystery here you tell them what's going on you as long as the kid is old enough to understand you explain this um, and the exposure drops off because your adrenal glands, I mean, your adrenaline and cortisol, you just can't keep that up for so long. 
but after a little pause period eventually your body goes into another alarm cycle so you want to stop when one alarm cycle ends and before the other one begins and usually 20 to 30 minutes is a really good time for that but what happens if you leave in the middle here well now you've done a massive avoidance you have become terrified by the therapist and then you avoided that and so you've been reinforced on a biological level for avoidance and you've just made their their entire disorder worse it, it, you've made it harder to treat and less likely to recover from so don't do this because if you can't control that situation you could make things worse and I worked a lot with the kids and we'd have backup plans and I had you know people on speed dial on the cell phone in case things went badly to keep them in that session and, I, and you go gradually you make sure that they can do the easy stuff before they go on to the next step you make sure that every step is locked in so every step isn't a massive jump from the previous steps and so this is all there's all a bit of an art and science to this kind of thing. Anyway, let's talk briefly about panic disorder. It has one of the higher um, overall ages of onset. Panic disorder is made up of panic attacks. So in the DSM, you say a panic disorder is panic attack, one or more panic attacks plus, you know, these other things. So what's a panic attack? It's just intense fear or terror with a sudden onset. You can have, many people have had panic attacks in their lives doesn't mean you've had panic dis panic disorder but a panic attack can be caused by lots of things including way too much caffeine all at once or a terrifying experience or oh my gosh I woke up and I just missed my exam and what am I gonna do I mean you can have a, a panic attack for a lot of reasons but panic disorder is a bit different so look at all these symptoms of panic attacks there's, there's a lot of things that can happen during panic attacks the DSM says you need four or more of the following things in other words these are classic sympathetic nervous system fear responses not anxiety not worry I mean this is immediate fear a panic attack can happen because something happens a dog barks at you out of nowhere and then you freak out for the next five minutes and that's your panic attack um, so a panic attack can be triggered or not triggered or well, cued or uncued um, but I'll talk about that in a second what a panic disorder it's weird if you just have one panic attack under the right circumstances you can be diagnosed with panic disorder it's kind of concerning I understand the reasoning for it and the research but still it's weird you can get a disorder for one panic attack not everybody who has a panic attack will get the disorder because you need other things so you also need to have worry about more panic attacks um, a woman I knew in high school developed panic disorder when she was a teenager which is kind of a classic time to get it she was an actor she was doing the high school drama she was with me in this show choir we were in this jazz choir and that's what we were doing and um, when she developed panic attack or panic disorder she started having a panic attacks and the first few times they were totally surprised out of nowhere curl up in a ball screaming for minutes at a time like in the dressing room for a play she was in and then at home and at school it started to happen and then she did the classic thing she developed agoraphobia over the next year or two because she um, became more and more afraid of having panic attacks in a public place where she couldn't feel safe and where it would be embarrassing and quite humiliating to have a panic attack and be totally having no control over your over yourself and stuff it's a pretty terrifying thing um, so panic disorder can be cued or uncued a cued is when there's a clear trigger and uncued is when there's not a clear trigger technically it's always cued but the understanding of the disorder now is that it's these physiological kind of events that happen everybody has moments when your heart skips a beat when you breathe a little shallowly for a little while when you suddenly feel dizzy these kinds of things but people who have panic disorder because of their genetic predisposition and possibly early life experiences but it's heavily biological they um, their bodies not conscious not rational their bodies decide that they're gonna die like they're freaking out over this thing which is not a concern at all like you just felt like you know lightheaded or short of breath for a minute and they might not be aware that that's happening so this is a current explanation for panic disorder and how it happens um, so this leads to agoraphobia as a secondary condition so agoraphobia is when you start to avoid situations where you could have a panic attack and not be in control of the situation or situations where you'd be in public it doesn't mean you're afraid of the outdoors there is agoraphobia without panic disorders which is a little more like that but panic disorder with agoraphobia is the thing that you see most commonly in clinical practice if you see agoraphobia and it's just secondary to panic disorder if you clear up the panic disorder the, the agoraphobia goes away um, yeah so panic disorder 
Some of the secondary symptoms include uh, overall behavior changes, especially social behavior changes, avoiding people, etc. Fear of dying or going crazy, um, overall agoraphobia. The prevalence, one or more panic attacks, pretty common. Like 16% is, is the estimate that I wrote down here between ages 12 and 17. Panic disorder, 0.5%. It's much more rare. Not so rare you won't see it. If you do clinical practice, you'll see it. Um, but it's not nearly up there with something like um, depression or ADHD or something like that. The onset is usually mid to late adolescence, and it might actually be underdiagnosed. People with panic disorder don't like to tell people that they have panic disorder. Uh, we have weird issues in cultures. We, yeah, we pee piles shame and, and opprobrium on people who have certain mental disorder conditions. So the course is quite variable. The duration is quite variable. Some people will have it for a while and then it stops. Some people it'll be on again, off again. A lot of people who have panic disorder, there does seem to be an expression of a deep biological anxiety proneness. And so it's going to come back in some form, but not always as panic disorder. Now the treatment is mostly the same as other anxiety disorders, but there's this component that tends to be common, at least at the time that I wrote this lecture a year or two ago, which was somatic retraining. So you have those body signals, and you're, and you're, yeah, it's not really unconscious, but it's so automatic and outside awareness, you're not totally aware that you're interpreting these body signals as being catastrophic when they actually aren't catastrophic. Oh no, my heart skipped a beat, I'm gonna die. No, of course not. It happens to everybody many times a day, right? It's just totally normal. But telling yourself rationally does nothing. This is not happening on a rational level. It's not happening inside your awareness. It's completely automatic. And so you need to retrain yourself physiologically to reinterpret that stuff. So you do weird stuff. You go to therapy and you have therapy pe you know, people in your group or individual therapy. You ask them to spin around in chairs and get dizzy. You ask them to breathe into paper bags and hyperventilate. You ask them to jump up and down and, and run in place and do jump ropes and run on treadmills to get their heart rate up and make themselves sweat. Sometimes you give them caffeine on purpose. Of course, you have to be careful of that make sure that they won't have a reaction to the caffeine in some way. Um, but you're doing this to provoke exposure to the thing that the theory says and there's a moderate amount of success to this this is successful quite for quite a number of people but not everybody all the time so there might be something missing from the theory but the theory seems to be relatively sound a lot of people gain a lot of benefit from this kind of thing you're trying to expose people to the thing that they developed anxiety from and now preventing preventing the avoidance after that is difficult because you might just trigger a bunch of panic attacks then what do you do well sometimes you just kind of live through the panic attacks, as I have learned from some very brave students I've known. Uh, so anyway, I want to talk briefly about a current theory of where a lot of this stuff, of how a lot of this stuff fits together. So internalizing means ang anxiety and depression mood type stuff. Internalizing symptoms. Internalizing symptoms can be categorized by, some research finds this categorization to help in two different ways. Anxious misery, and fear. So fear is immediate, I'm afraid, oh my gosh, panic, right? And so the when, so fear symptoms are most dominant in things like specific phobia, social phobia, agoraphobia, panic disorder, right? Agoraphobia that's by itself without panic disorder. And anxious misery symptoms, these are more long-term chronic slow burn type things, major depressive disorder, dysthymic disorder, and GAD. But this, this symptom here, this characteristic anxious misery, it seemed a tendency towards experiencing anxious misery as it's called, um, and it, it is exactly what it says, seems to be kind of built in, another one of these temperament type things. And so GAD, because of its anxious misery component, might have a much stronger connection to depression and those kinds of things, because look, major over here you've got major depressive disorder and dysthymic disorder those are mood disorders and GAD is lumping with them it's not lumping so much with the anxiety disorder so GAD might be just overall anxiety proneness but then this is an alternative view maybe this research suggests it's an expression of this anxious misery business so the answers are not all the way in yet now before we talk about obsessive compulsive disorder I'm going to take a break and make that into a totally different video